you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button as well as the bell to be notified of future videos. Thank you. Hello Internet, we are back and uh, we're continuing with questions. It's the last episode of that, episode 3. We have our guest here, Franz Fauré, as well as uh, Jack Greer and Doe Stein. All of them served in South African Special Forces. All of them are well known. Two of them at least has written books. And Franz Fauré, everybody asked me about his book. Well, you know, he's just grinning when I ask him. But I know there's a book where it will come out at some stage. Between these men, they have more than 50 years of experience of Special Forces operations. And now we are continuing. We are continuing where we left off, where we're going to answer questions which you, the viewer, sent to us, I think about two, three weeks ago now. Gentlemen, you're welcome here. Thank you for your time. We really appreciate it. Let's start with the questions. Right, the next question is, it's more a statement, and I will ask you if it's true or not, and then try and answer it. It says here, in regular units, the abuse of rank was a frequent occurrence. Were special forces any different? Now, let us start at the beginning. First question to all of you. Is it true that the abuse of rank was frequent in all standard units, non-special forces units, because all of you came from that. I mean, you didn't end up in special forces just like that. You had to come from somewhere. Jack, what do you think of, uh, of that statement? Uh, Chris, uh, <clears throat> abuse of rank in the infantry units, I've never heard of it. The discipline in the a, in a, in a SADF was very strict. What did happen? It's not an abuse of rank, but you had what we called, or what, what can be called career officers, that the sole aim in the military was to get on the highest rank as, pos as quickly as possible, uh, and in the process, brown nose, uh, an Afrikaans gatkrijp, to, to get to his position, as, to the highest position as quickly as possible, so that he can get rid of all these plebs that he has to look after every day. Then you had your career, uh, your, your, your professional soldier, that his whole life and his passion was his men under him and to lead his, the many, uh, his men in combat. So those two, you find those two categories of officers you find in any, arm, in any military uh, army. <clears throat> in the special forces, we never had that. The special forces officer that, that joined the unit, the recce unit, firstly, had to operate under a, a, a senior NCO for a, one or two operations and be checked out. If he did not perform pr uh, properly or he's got, he had a problem, and there were some of them, he would have been reported and that guy did not go very far in the unit. He would have been moved out to intelligence or support or whatever. Um, then we also had a system what what we call the ops debriefing. So after every uh, operation, we had a thorough debriefing and uh, uh, everybody on that debriefing could say what you think went wrong and who did it something wrong. And there were debriefings where the, com the, the officer commanding or the person in charge of that operation were taken on because of his poor navigation, for instance. That kind of stuff is important to, to sort out that abuse. And then there was another uh, system we had in place what we called Freedom Square. That was in Doppies, Fort Doppies, where we had a, an area, a square, circle, called it the square, Freedom Square, where the operators, if he had a problem with any other operator or any officer or NCO, he would stand up and pronounce that. And the situation will be discussed and sorted out there. And the guys would break up, carry on with their jobs, and at night to have a drink, a beer together. Yes, there were some first fights after Freedom Square, somewhere in the bush. But again, that night after a few beers, the problems were sorted out. So, uh, and on also the, the strength of character of your operators. 
would not have allowed any officer or senior NCO to abuse his rank in the special forces. He would never have got even a, a, a minute further than what he would have. They would have quickly, the operator, the normal operator would have quickly put him on his place if he started doing that. So uh, <clears throat> we, we had never, uh, we never had uh, that kind of problem that other regular units might have had that I'm aware of. Thank you, that was comprehensive. Was, um, in my military career, I never experienced that. It's a perception from the individual. The military has a, a strict um, command and control regime. And um, I, I think people, I don't say that it did not happen, but um, I've, I've experienced it once and I'll refer that to you um, at the end of, of what I'm saying now, but um, you, know, you, know, you know, people that cannot accept a, a, a disciplinary structure where you have rank, where, where um, you, you know, you can be a colonel, but you are still, or a, a, a major general, or a brigadier, or a, a, a W1, or whatever, you still serve under somebody. So, you know, if, if you get too big for your boots to accept the, um, the higher structure, you know, you, you start finding that. And I think all professional soldiers um, conducted themselves in such a way that, um, um, you know, you respected the, 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 the structure. I think uh, Jack summed it up very, very well within special forces. Um, I've mentioned it in, in, in my last um, episode when I had the individual episode I experienced where a major general, um, because he did not do his job and was actually um, apprehended by chief of the defense force, he took it out on, on me. Um, but um, that, that, that's the only time I ever experienced um, that you know, somebody, to my opinion, abused his uh, rank completely. Jack, if I can ask you, does compromise necess necessarily mean death? In other words, if, if I become aware, the enemy becomes aware of you, uh, of, your, of the two of you doing the recon, uh, does that mean death? No, not necessarily. If the, if the team deploys properly and uh, implement all the safety measures and uh, hide security measures that they're supposed to do, they can detect enemy presence or enemy approaching well beforehand and ex uh, extract themselves from that situation. If you do get compromised, it's an unhealthy situation because it normally results in a hell of a long run with the enemy chasing you. And if you're a thousand kilometers from home, you're going to run uh, for the whole day. You're not going to be uh, help assisted. You're not going to receive any support for the whole day. So, and you might find yourself, especially in the flats of Angola, uh, running for two, three days at a time with the enemy on your heels, chasing you. Uh, the important thing is that if you are compromised, the mission failed. So a reconnaissance mission should not be compromised. Otherwise, its mission failed. And if the reconnaissance mission failed, the, the, the main mission, the primary mission, perhaps an attack or a raid, also fails. So it is very, uh, important not to be compromised. So the team must do everything in their power to stay hidden and not get compromised. Sorry, there are instances where people were killed, obviously. Uh, there are uh, a couple of instances where the guys had to really run for their lives and uh, and survive for two, three days in heat, no water, radio shot up, that kind of stuff. So, yes, it has happened. Uh, guys were killed. Guys were chased. Um, it, does, it does happen. But it's not a rule. Okay, next question. It was originally addressed to France, but I suppose anyone who wish to answer can answer. And the question is, 
does the commanding officer know everything? And if so, what is the security risk against him and his family, I suppose, in the base back in South Africa? Is it possible that a terrorist in some way can attack him or blackmail him or, you know, do something to him? Well, if I may, um, I think it's important for everybody to understand that there's different levels of knowing what is going on. Um, commanders on all levels, and if I if I talk about commanders, I'm including senior NGOs, the RSM or your team leaders or whatever. And remember, a team leader can either be an officer or an NGO. So don't see commanders only in the uh, view of, of, of officers. Um, but uh, so chief of the defense force to advise this the, the security council and the state president in terms of what is happening and what should be planned and how you know the, the, the defense force should be structured, etc. Surely he must have access to the spectrum of um, information and knowledge. Otherwise, he can't, cannot execute and probably plan and strategize. And that cascades down. If, if, if you have a war theater and you have uh, an officer commanding the war theater to advise the, um, the, the chief of the defense force in order for the chief of the defense force to allocate um, arms of service and um, resources to actually execute the operation, it is obvious that he should be informed properly. So that, you know, on each level. But I think in, um, to get to special forces, we have a principle of um, compartmentalization. Um, we, we, we plan our operations in silos. In other words, um, I can recall very, very well, I was serving under um, Doe, um, you know, I was one of his team leaders, and um, then we started developing the COVID stuff, and um, you know, and I would disappear, disappear, and and they would say, "Where the hell were, uh, have you been?" But you know, it, it's not me disappearing. It is um, our commander was Hans Fenter. You know what Hans Fenter communicates to Doe as to where I am or not. You. You, you know, and to, to keep certain things in a silo that certain only a certain group of people or individuals know what is happening and so on. But, you know, that is why I said in the past, that's why I respect the commanders like those things, that he has the mental ability and capacity to understand that principle within the special forces organization. So, you know, if I would, for instance, execute a covert operation, come back with information and don't, you, you know, as the, the, the group commander plans the offensive, then things comes together again. So, um, you know, if um, what, what Jack just referred to as, um, you know, if you are compromised, etc. So if you are compromised and um, the worst thing happens that you are captured and interrogated and, you know, that, so that you cannot spill the beans on other activities of um, the organization or operations that, that are planned. So, yes, to answer the question directly, a, a, a commander within his um, sphere of operations should know everything so he can plan, think out of the square and um, come up with a, a solution. But um, how does that impact on the family? I've never, you know, movies and James Bond and these things, yes. 
you know, why does the state president always have, after he's retired, you know, a certain protection team looking after after him? You know, if you are really a heavy, heavy, yes. But, um, you know, I think on our levels, uh, I think we've always been aware of your own safety, environmental awareness of what's happening around you, personal security, etc., should remain in terms of yourself and your family, but it was never a hoo-ha in, in, in the time I served. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody who wants to say something there before we move to Kevin Johnson's questions? Well, I just want to add with France, I think it covered everything. Uh, but if you look at why we in a unit wasn't... Um, wasn't informed. Uh, out of four Ricky, there will be three or four operations going on at a simultaneous time, and nobody knew who what was doing. And we and that was just a modus operandi. We didn't ask questions. Everybody did his own thing, and so four operations was finished without interfering in one other operation or why this or why that. That was one thing. And then the other thing that we must remember, although we were special forces. In the older times, in the times that we served, we fight it and our target was enemy outside the borders of our country. It was not a terrorist running around looking for heads to kill or sabotage of a gate or this or that. So no, the, the execution of our operations was external. The enemy was external. And most of the times we they did not know who did the operation, who blow up the bridge, who did this, or who attacked us. They didn't know where we are, where we come from, so they couldn't really uh, plan a execution operation against whoever in the units and say, okay, sorry, boy, you were there, you're going to die now. It was not like that. The enemy was external, and we fight at the external war. Thank you for that. Appreciate your answers. Now we're getting to Kevin Johnson, ex-policeman, ex free to battalion, one of the great people on the show. He really assisted us in the background. But he's got a, quite a couple of questions. The first one is, and this is to all of you, whoever wants to answer, what was the drill on operations if you encountered a great white shark or sharks? Franz, I see you grinning there in the background. Of course, you're ex free to battalion yourself, so up to you. Uh, Chris, thank you. I'm going to, I'll answer and, and Doe has to um, add on, please. Because Doe used to refer to the great white shark as that big thing with a grey coat. Now, um, you know, uh, a great white shark, uh, I, I just want to quickly, you know, I went in Hansby, I, I went um, cage diving. And, you know, there from a, a protected environment, you actually see this creature. And there was sharks, five meters, four meters. And it is just a amazing creature. And the power, I saw them hanging vertically in the, in the water. And then, you know, they draw the um, bait over it. It wags its tail twice and it propels itself out of the water completely clear. So, you know, it, it, it's the pinnacle of the predators in the sea. But yes, um, uh, uh, we've encountered or personally encountered them in um, Simonstown Harbor. Now, 99,9% .9 of our diving operations and exercises takes place at night. So thank God for that, because I, I think if you really see what's happening around you, you will not get into the sea. But um, uh, so our drill and what we were taught um, was, you know, if you encounter a shark and it starts circling you, you get back to back to your with your buddy and you always face the shark. And if it moves in because it moves in 
and it normally brushes against the um, the bait or the target or whatever you want to call it because they have um, sensors on their bodies that can actually taste or sense if it's if it's um, you know food or not so uh, and then obviously on the nose they have the um, ambuseli or Borrelli or you know funny um, name for the sensors on their nose and um, you know if they come close you can um, bump them off but um, if a shark comes in for an attack it comes in for an attack it's like a special forces soldier if it comes in for an attack it comes in for an attack bump on the nose is not going to uh, reflect it but um, in the harbor in Simon's town we used to encounter them. I've encountered them three or four times there and really big shots. Now, you, there we could see them because the lights on the harbor, we, we used to do reconnaissance um, diving operations into Simon's Town to wreck the harbor and the ships, etc. So if that happened, you would alert your buddy because you dive in buddy pairs and then, um, okay so that you know, and then you watch the actions of the, the shark. You would move towards either uh, the hull or the side of a ship or the key side. And if um, the, the rebreathers and oxygen, oxygen gets toxic, I think after seven meters or so, but you can for short periods dive down to uh, 10 meters because a shark needs open water to attack and to, to, to bite. So if you are against the wall or on the, um, the, the, the bottom, you know, it can't really attack you or, or it wouldn't. The likelihood is, is remote. And then, um, you know, if they disappear, you carry on with your dive. Obvi uh, most of the times you go up, you surface, you inform the, the diving supervisor of uh, the sharks in the, the, in the vicinity, and um, if the diving supervisor um, deems it too dangerous, they would um, probably, you know, draw out the divers. But um, in 99% of the cases, it did not happen. So, um, yes, you know, it's like walking through the bush, encountering a lion or a rhino or a leopard or whatever. So, um, you know, the analogy is there. So whatever you do in the water, it's just another um, dimension. So, you know, stay away from their environment and, and, and be safe. Um, I don't know, Doe can maybe correct me. There's divers that is much, much, much more um, qualified and advanced than I am. But um, as to up to this moment, I have never heard of any shark incident um you know attack on any of our attack divers um up to now Chris. thank you no can can we hear from you because i know that one fellow was attacked by a crocodile but that was in a river that was not not in the ocean it wasn't a great white dead deep shark was yes the um as franz said i i can't record that there was any of our divers, and I, we're now referring to our experienced divers in the unit, that really was attacked by great white sharks. There was a lot of other uh, um, humoristic attacks by, I don't know what Rob in English is, what's Rob? A rope is a seal. Seal. seal yeah, a seal. seal. I'll say, okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, we were attacked by seals in the water and not really attacked, but they will come in and they will come right to your face. And uh, the only thing that he could see in the dark is our depth meter or our compass. Then he push his nose into the compass and see what is what it is and what is it uh, doing there. And some of our divers, specifically Al Tuffy, was bit on his head by one of the seals and that is just uh, that was all happened in uh, the Langaban area where they usually dived with us and really see what we were doing then the other big disadvantage of diving that i personally experienced was in Valfus bay where we came across a lot of uh, jellyfish 
And as I talk about a lot of jellyfish, you couldn't see ahead of you. And uh, that was a real big obstacle in the water due to the uh, density, due to the size of the, of the jellyfish. And that made it very, very difficult to navigate because remember it's dark, you cannot see, you can just feel it. And uh, that was quite a risky operation in the Walfus Bay Harbor. Thank you. Well, I'm glad to hear that Special Forces was not following the police diver way, which is to stab your mate and swim away as quickly as possible. But just an old joke. Jack, do you have anything to say about these white deaf sharks? Uh, in, in one reconnaissance regiment, we had an agreement with the sharks. They don't come in, uh, we don't go into the water and they don't come into the pups. Got nothing to add. Okay, Kevin is asking us if you ever uh, worked with a South African or a South African Railway Police Task Forces. Uh, Jack, did you ever work? Uh, I cannot recall in my time that we have done operations with them. We have done, uh, done training with the, especially the Railway Task Force, Special Task Force, uh, urban training, uh, where we shared techniques and tactics. They attended our courses and we attended some of their training and it went very well. The relationship was very good on operator level. On a command level, the relationship for some other reason was a bit sour. But uh, uh, personally, I feel at that stage, the railway task, for, task force was a bit more professional than the police task force. That has obviously changed. A lot of those guys have, have now joined, the, have at that time joined the SAP uh, task force and they have uh, obviously integrated their skills and training. So, uh, you know, the, uh, improving the capability of the, of the police at that time. Now, did you ever work with it, with the task forces? Never. Hans? You ever had the opportunity to work with these uh, task force people? Of course, yes. Um, bear in mind, after the um, Olympic Games in Munich, when um, the Arabs attacked the Israelis, um, the Israelis sent in um, a special task force to uh, react against and free the, the athletes. Um, in Johannesburg, in Santon, an uh, incident occurred where the police had to react against um, terrorists that um, did something there. I know it was called the Royerist, the policeman. Um, he sorted out the situation. And then very shortly thereafter, there was an attack on um, the, the Volkskast Bank in Silverton where the police force and people by the name of Tini Stridom and uh, Mike Fryer was um, the team and, and plus some other policemen that um, actually resolved the situation in the, the Volkskast Bank. Then um, shortly thereafter, uh, and I, uh, 81, towards the end of 81, um, the chief of the defense force decided to send some people to Israel to get some training on um, uh, anti-terrorist actions, the anti-hijacking techniques on aircraft, uh, planes, buses, um, and, and um, buildings. So there was a uh, four people from special forces that went over and two people from the police. Um, and it was Tini Stridom and Mike Fryer. And from the special forces, it was Davi Furi, myself, um, James Teitge and Roy Vermaak. So we did the um, anti-terrorist uh, urban um, training in Israel. And the, the, the primary uh, goal was to bring back the doctrines and obviously the training, etc., um, to develop that 
in special forces and with the police um, task force um, to focus on the question that you work with the railway police special forces task force no but um, what i do know and what i can testify is that the original training and the doctrines and the training material um, came from the group that that went over and obviously the police task force must have trained and that's an assumption i am making must have trained the the um, the railway police i am thoroughly aware of the railway police and as jack has said um, i can recall very clearly in, in durban that we participated and worked with or trained with um, the the railway police um of course yes so uh, how that progressed later on i know when tini and uh, mike fryer came back they developed that and i think that is when the saps or the sap um, developed their special um, task force and i think the you know the progression from there went on and um, special forces uh, and the police task force uh, worked together on occasions uh, we had defined the roles um, the special forces would act externally if there was any incident outside the borders of south africa special forces would um, execute those tasks and if it was internally within the boundaries of south africa the special task force the police task force would uh, execute um, in internally special forces would be on standby to assist and um, help the the police task force Thank you, Chris. Okay, thank you for that. We invite always everybody, and if there's a special task force member here who wants to come and tell us, you're more than welcome. Let us go to the next question, also from Kevin. He wants to know if Buffalo operators and four Doppies operators, would they have benefit more if they have socialized more from time to time? I suppose he means a recon, uh, Rito Battalion recon wing. Uh, yeah, uh, it's not exactly clear what what uh, what Kevin wants to know there, but if it's socially, uh, I don't think that was necessary. The times that three two battalion operators and one recce operators or five or, or whoever operators got together, it was a major uh, event and. The, uh, they made up for lost time and for time that will be lost uh, in the future until they meet again. The other socializing in, uh, uh, venues were the courses in infant, at infantry school. Now, any course leader there would be horrified if he stands in front of the course and there's a, a few 3-2 battalion camouflage berets sitting in the audience and some maroon recce berets, he immediately knew he had a major problem on his hands. So I think when we did get together, the socializing was intense and really nice. And uh, I don't think we could have benefited anything more by getting to, to by socializing more. I don't think any, we would have benefited anything. Thanks. Now, do you have any comments? Oh, I see Francis first, but between the two of you. Yeah, Francis can prat. I will let you step some. So it's lekker gegaan. You do it. That's good. Thank you. Uh, yes, Chris. Um, bear in mind, I, you know, 32 Battalion is also a, a voluntary organization, and you know they they really where where the tacky eats the tar in terms of warfare. They were involved special forces as well so the recce groups and bear in mind i'm also a, a forming or a starter slit of the 32 battalion recce wing where um, the recce is by people by the name of um, andre didrax louis klopper and fanny fonse trained us um, and a, a very very good um, uh, minor tactics and and certain other courses i i did the same course in um 
in special forces. So, you know, the standards and the, it was, it was equal. So I think the basic training that the Reiki wing of 32 battalion received was very, very well. Um, due to the professionalism of Andre Diedrichs, um, Louis Klopper and, and Fanny Fonsa at that stage. So, um, but as I've said in one of the um, first questions that was asked, the, the nature of the tasks between um, the reconnaissance that had to be done by the, um, Special Forces and 32 Battalion on the tactical and operational level in Southern Angola was pretty much the same. But each organization develops their own culture and way the, the, the way they execute operations. So I think it's good to learn. If you go on a formal course to one of the organizations, you know, you learn the formal stuff. But if you sit in a bar and socialize and whatever, it's very, um, it's good to socialize and to interact. It's, it's brilliant. I mean, you make good camaraderie and, you know, you get to know the people. But you must be very careful sitting in a bar or sitting around a bright place fire, listening to the way Jack executes his uh, small team operation and trying to go and execute that when you deploy as a 32 battalion member. So, you know, when it comes to professionalism in terms of executing the task, um, socializing can be valuable, but beware of um, stories around the Bryflay field. Rather attend the, the, the formal courses. Thank you. The other question would be, and anybody can answer it, how many of the free to battalion people became special forces operators? Of course, if I may, um, the, we, we, in special forces, and this comes from one of your highly, highly um, respected personnel um, NCOs, uh, warrant officer Fricky Vermaak, and then um, another officer that is doing a lot of research and is also in the process of publishing a book, Tinas de Tlerk, um, we, we never meticulously kept a record of, you know, how many people came from which unit or, or so on. But um, we have it um, on record and by collectively putting our minds together, there was 11 white guys that came over from 32, to 32 battalion to special forces. That is excluding Colonel Jan Breitenbach, Pewe van Jerden, Mario Jacobs, Jakes, Pat Corbett, and Daniel Roxo, which was actually in special forces before they went over to 32 Battalion. So there was an interaction between the two units. Um, then, um, as far as we could establish, there was about 30, uh, 23 um, um, other colored people either um, you, completely black or, or mulatto that came over from um, 32 battalion to special forces stand to be corrected right the last question which we have from kevin he was uh, like a platoon sergeant there perhaps a bit more i know at the last the last phase of his time at uh, free to he was there at the training wing He's asking, did any of you work with my two corporals, which he describes as Cole, uh, Tall, Costa, and Petru? Now, this was in the early 80s. I don't know if that's a sufficient description. Franz, do you know such people? Of course, yes. I think uh, um, Jack will also be, Ando, will be um, able to, to comment. Um, Pedro... Um, Either his first name or his second name, you you know I can't place him now. But um, uh, Tol Tol Costa, of course, what a brilliant operator, um, a dynamic guy. Um, uh, he was also involved in the small teams, and I think Jack will uh, comment more on that. But Costa, um, very intelligent, um, charismatic 
soldier. And um, I think at this point in time, as we are speaking, he is the um, Sergeant Major of Special Forces at um, Special Forces HQ. So uh, a brilliant guy. And um, I haven't encountered anybody that came over from 32 that um, did not um, pay his weight in gold within Special Forces. Jack, do you know these two people? Uh, it's difficult, you know, uh, a lot of Portuguese surnames are Costa and a lot of them are Pedro. If, if the Costa is Sergeant Major uh, Doc Costa, uh, yes, I know him very well. He's the small team operator, worked with Diderix and those guys. Brilliant guy. If the other, the Pedro operator is, uh, let me just get that name, uh, uh, Victor, Victor Pedro. Victor uh, was in one reconnaissance. He was one of the first black guys that we recruited for one reconnaissance regiment. And uh, Victor Pedro drowned during an exercise under Durban City in one of the uh, uh, stormwater drains, which suddenly received water from somewhere and a high tide came in from, from the sea and trapped the guys under the, uh, uh, under the city in the stormwater drain. And he panicked and and drowned in the process. Uh, so yes, we, we know, if those are the two guys, we know them, we have worked with them. Brilliant operators, all of, both of them. No, did you know these, these two, three, two battalion people? If it's a Costa that we're speaking about, I also think very good soldier in terms of small, small teams. And I think he was working with Didi's that passed away some time ago. And uh, yes, he was a good soldier and where he is now, he deserves that. Thank you for that. And that, you know, we're done with Kevin. So we're going to somebody called Calvin Gilbert. And he has a question for Franz Fauré. And he's asking Franz, what do you foresee for South Africa in the next 24 months uh, in terms of security and safety? Rons, what do you see? It's, it's difficult to predict. All I want to say, and the way I'm going to answer the, the question is, um, you know, to make predictions and, and so on is, is dangerous. All I want to say is that if you look at the current situation in South Africa um, with um, internal um, rivalry, between certain political parties and within certain political um, parties, uh, one should brace yourself for um, probably instability of some sorts. And then on the economical front, I want to say that the fluctuation of the energy prices Energy prices being electricity and fuel is a major input within the production factors on all levels. So um, I can just feel that on the farm. You know, ESCOM, the prices are just escalating exponentially. And, um, you know, to keep the tractors and whatever going in terms of diesel, etc., you know, the, the input prices are just getting higher and higher and the margins in terms of running a business, um, not only in the farming sector, you know, is really going to be a challenge. So I want to suffice there security wise. I also, I always want to um, advise people just be environmentally switched on. Open your eyes. Don't walk with a earphones in your ears when you walk down the street so that you can hear what is going on around you and um, see, keep your eyes open um, and so on. So live safely and um, be observant and um, watch what is going on politically and then economically. I think the major factors 
are the um, fuel price and um, ESCOM. Uh, <laughs> that's coming from someone who is a total novice on, on, on the subject. Thank you. No, there's a question for you, specifically addressed to you. Uh, it's asking, what are your thoughts on Russia and China, as well as on Iran and Israel at this point in time? I'm not sure in what uh, context, uh, probably military or the Third World War breaking out or something. Of course, yes, I can now start and explaining and philosophy about everything. I don't want to say it. I don't want to uh, comment on anything of that. I experienced a few and a lot of Russians. And I, all I can say, they are very hard people. They are people and they are soldiers that are very hard, that can live in any condition without the hamburger and a Coke. And what the Chinese, uh, uh, if you look at the, my book, uh, Special Forces, The Men Speak, you'll see that spe our special forces was trained by, uh, was some of the training was done by Chinamen in terms of their firearms and things like that. So I don't know what is the outcome. I can't compare any country on the moment with, I can't do it because I'm only a soldier and I'll live by that. Thank you. Thank you for that answer though. It's appreciated. Jack? He wants to know about Mozambique and specifically uh, Cabo Delgado. That's the province, I believe, where uh, the trouble is right now. And he says there are talks amongst people of training camps, I suppose, for terrorists in South Africa. What is your view in this regard? Chris, uh, yeah, the group operating in Cabo Delgado. Uh, name themselves, call themselves Anzar Al Suna Wayama, something to that effect. Every report I read, the name changes somewhat, the spelling, etc. So I'll call them Al Suna. It sounds, it sounds very uh, Muslim-like and uh, uh, militant-like. So uh, well, let's stick to the name Al Suna. Uh, they are fairly good intelligence. Uh, common knowledge that there are South Africans working with them there. Uh, who exactly they are, I don't know. It's open source information at the state, but there are South Africans there. As far as the potential, uh, as, well, South Africa is a good feeder country for them, uh, especially from the Western Cape or Cape, Western Cape, Southern Cape, and then KwaZulu Natal, where there's a lot of Muslim people group together that can act as feeder for these guys. Uh, training camps, one must not see their training camps as the ones you see on TV where the guys are running around in their white dresses or sandals, jumping over burning tires and shouting and shooting. I don't think we'll have that. We'll have that. Yeah, I hope not. Uh, one must see training camps rather as a house where some of those guys get together as a cell, three or four or five of them, and receive training from an ex-military guy or some guy that see, uh, sees himself as, as an expert in military subjects and now wants to make some money and teach these guys in hand grenades and small arms, fire, fire uh, AKs and, and, and pistols. I, if that is happening, I hope, certainly hope that our intelligence services knows about that, pick that up and, and get to grips with the guys. Um, I also doubt if Al Suna will, will, uh, will expand to the point where the jihadist in Middle East uh, is where they execute suicide bomb bombings at, uh, against targets. I doubt they will go that far. Their main motivation in Mozambique is drugs, uh, uh, precious metals, oil. So, so they're in it for the gain, for the financial gain, not as a, uh, what's the word, a, a religious exercise where they 
practice their religion to the point of where they become fanatical. These guys are more in it for the for the financial gain. So yeah, um, you, uh, I'm not saying suicide bombs will not happen in South Africa. There's been some bombs linked to these groups in the past couple of years ago, but. Uh, I, I, it's not going to be something that they will be keen to do. Although you might find some lunatic that runs off on his own and blows himself up thinking he's, he's going to be, become a hero. But not at the scale at which is done in, uh, in the Middle East. Hi, gentlemen. We now have uh, the question for those Danes from Andre de Toe. He talks about Operation Coolidge. And he wants to know, we did the reconnaissance of a bridge before the actual team went in. How many days did that take, the reconnaissance? And how much swimming in kilometers uh, were performed? And he's asking if you could perhaps share your experience to us. Okay, of course, yes, Coolidge, as everybody knows, it was an operation in Quito Carnaval in the final days of our war in Angola. It was a um, attack on the bridge, on a very strategical bridge. But I want to bring back the whole situation. He ran about in the 1980s. FAPLA, the Cubans and the Russians start to build up to uh, attack Mavinga, as a, which was at that time the main logistical base uh, of UNITA. And that base was situated in on the other side of uh, the Quito Carnaval bridge. In 1980, and that whole thing started in 90, 1986, and they called that operation on the Russian side, and I want to read it, Congresso 2, which started in 1985. When we saw what was happening, we as a South Africans, we saw that um, they are building up uh, to attack uh, UNITA's logistical base. In early 1986, we decided to attack the, the harbor of Dros Day in Namib, Namib and we, and we uh, sank a lot of ships there with a lot of military equipment on. And in the same time, the UNITA decided to gather information and they decided they want to do a reconnaissance on the bridge as well as on the uh, Quito Carnaval little town, which they did. And then they decided they're going to attack it, and that was called Operation Shuva. Now, Shuva was done, and the two liaison officers was Colonel Brett Sachs and also Lieutenant Colonel Ratman. They were the liaison officers between Special Forces and UNITA, that which assisted them to do the operation. So the, the, the team that wanted to attack the bridge of UNITA was consist of six guys, two rowers, two engineers, and two special forces guys. So they went down on the, on the river with about 12 charges of 3.5 kilogram each. They already decided on where they're going to put the charges, how they're going to blow up the bridge and what they're going to do. But what was not reckoned into the whole situation in the reconnaissance day that prior was the uh, stream and the strength of the stream that on that stage it was about two two meters per second and they were they passed the bridge they, they standed on the other side of the bridge and they came back with the coming back to the to the bridge which they wanted to destroy the uh, sentries on the, on the uh, bridge saw them and they start shooting. Uh, the, the UNITA team retaliated and shot one entry and he fell into the water. So, and the team went off, they went off stream and this, the operation was unsuccessful. After that, we ended, we, uh, we started our, we still decided that we must now do the reconnaissance of the bridge and we must attack that, meaning we, meaning the special forces. So in early, in June 1986, we decided that, um, yes, this is the right time to do the reconnaissance. And again, 
I was the operation commander of that specific reconnaissance. The two guys that do the reconnaissance, that do the uh, diving and the reconnaissance was Sergeant Adams and Sergeant Anton Bierkman. And uh, they were assisted by, again, by uh, the liaison office of, of Colonel Ratman. And they, uh, they were transferred from our, eight, from our tactical HQ that was around about 30 kilometers uh, east of the bridge. And they, was, they went from there by chopper and from, from the chopper with, uh, with uh, vehicles and from there with foot to the river. They used a inflatable kayak, an inflatable canoe to do their operation. And uh, they were dropped off around about 28 kilometers north of the bridge. And they rode in and around about 800 meters from the bridge, they destroyed the, uh, the, uh, the canoe, which was, which was very difficult in that um, circumstances due to the, was blow up and the make noise when it blow down and all that was uh, done. Then they, then they dived to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the bridge. With no problems, they, did, they got all the technical detail on the bridge in terms of the width of the bridge, the length of the bridge, the, uh, the piers, how many piers were there, what is the size of the pier, what was the piers made of. And in that same upper, then they dived off with that, all, all with those information. Their pickup point was around about 3.5 kilometers from the bridge on the southern side. Once they got to the bridge, there was a lot of enemy activity and there was also a lot of shooting going on because then, if, if, uh, then the enemy detected them. They decided to carry on and around about 14 kilometers further the next day, they were only uh, picked up by Sergeant Erasmus and uh, they withdraw back to the base. They were very, very uh, exhausted not because of tired, but exhausted in terms of the water and the type of water they were swimming in in the streams and so on. And they had a lot of water and food to drink. They were very, very weak when they got out of the water and the time they take, they took a, around about eight hours to do this whole operation until the next day. And that eight hours was solidly in the water or under the water. And uh, then they, uh, they did the reconnaissance, they got all the information, and there was a few lessons learned out of this whole operation. That was then taken to, uh, to the information given to the team that attacked us. And one of the, they tried to use a water anchor. A water anchor is a thing that you screw into the sand and then try to keep you underneath the bridge and then to do your operations under, under the bridge in terms of adding your charges and whatever. But this thing was very sharp and very sensitive and that, uh, the, that damaged the, the uh, canoe and they couldn't take that. The other one that they were also very uh, scared of and what they tried to do was to drive to dive with dry suits for them, especially for the escape and evasion, then they will have the uniforms on and they can go. But there again, they couldn't use the dry suits because of the branches the, and the thing could get cut and could damage and they couldn't use that. So they used a very thin wetsuit uh, for due to the heat of the water in the first place. And the second thing of the comfortability in the time of uh, which they dived in the water. And then the last thing was the, the canoes that they used. That was very critical because the attack team already started to prepare and they had to change the, uh, the canoe totally to something else to use, uh, on the, uh, to, use to transport the attack team to the, uh, to the bridge. Uh, that is it. I'm not going to elaborate and start telling long stories. That's a fact. Thank you for that. The next question is for Franz Bori. Now, Franz, you've been on the show before and we're very, very popular. 
But you said apparently in uh, episode five, that's the last one, uh, you mentioned that we lost the war. And the question then is, could you explain this in detail as why we lost? Of course, yes. A war is fought for political reasons. Um, so, the battles and the conflicts that was encountered and engaged in, we all won. But politically, we have lost the war, what we fought for. So, that's why I said we've lost the war. And, and I just want to put that into context. Um, that um, part was taken out of probably the time I instituted the um, Golden Operator's badge with the diamonds in, when the morale of um, Special Forces operators was probably at a low. So I can pretty much remember when, when, when I made that statement. So after the political change in South Africa, you know, a lot of people said, or a lot of operators, you know, they said, we fought the war for so many years and this, that, and the other. And now here we are, you know, in the hands of, of the people we actually fought against. So that's why I said, we've lost the war. But the battles within, um, I think we have very, very well sorted out. So, of course, I don't want to make this a political matter. I think the, the political change that, um, that, you know, the, the, the de democratic process that was followed in South Africa, that is part of history, and we have to accept it that way. And um, at that stage in um, 95, at the end of 94, when I took command of um, one Special Forces Regiment, when, where we were involved in integrating, um, you know, the, 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 the people that came in, um, we did it in a professional way with no political uh, motives or whatever we carried on to be professional um, but um, yes to answer the question why is that um, we fought against um, communist expansion and um, obviously the bipolar um, east-west situation has changed and um, that's why I made that standpoint and I still stand by that as I sit here today. What France have said is, is so. I believe it wasn't wasted. <clears throat> we lost the war. We won the battles. We lost the war. But if we did not fight that war, we would have been in a much more bigger... The country, South Africa, would have been in a much more bigger trouble than, than uh, what we are now. We would have been another 20 years down the drain. We now are 25 years down the drain. Imagine we did not fight that war. Uh, it would have added another 20 years. So we would have been 45 years down the drain. Uh, and imagine what this country would have looked like. So uh, I don't have regrets of having uh, been involved in that war. And uh, I don't think we've, we've lost it. Uh, politically, yes. The political side, we've, we've, uh, we didn't win. But the war, we, we won. And... Uh, it, there was a good reason for that, and uh, I think it achieved the objective. It delayed the inevitable decay which you have in Africa. Thanks. Yeah, I cannot agree more because it's a negotiated settlement. And what happened after that cannot be blamed on the soldiers or the policemen or anybody else. Time that the politicians stand up and take uh, some... Uh, responsibility for the actions. It's that simple. That is uh, the last question here from Andre de Twee. And Andre, thanks for that. We appreciate you, you sending the letter. Can the panel explain the collapse of Rhodesia? 
No, Rhodesia also didn't collapse as far as I know. There was uh, also a negotiated settlement. And then uh, Mugabe got involved, got himself uh, elected. Jesuit trained fellow, by the way. And from there on, it went very much down for, for Rhodesia and it became Zimbabwe. And we know where Zimbabwe is now. Uh, Jack, any ideas on why Rhodesia collapsed? Uh, yeah, I, I didn't prepare for this question. I don't see it on my list here, but uh, uh, Rhodesia collapsed politically. I mean, there was so much political pressure uh, from, from uh, all over, mainly Britain and South Africa. And South Africa pulled a carpet from under them. So we've, we pulled out military, uh, pulled out our military, and the, the, the British uh, just applied the pressure. So they, they, there's no way they could have kept standing. Um, that's why uh, they became Zimbabwe. I, I think it was just pure political pressure from everybody involved uh, is, uh, with the British in the front line, right in the front. Uh, and then South African government that, uh, that obviously collaborated and pulled out the military support. So that's my view. And I have to agree with it completely. Franz, do you have any words on that? Because I know special forces were involved in Rhodesia, as were the police long before um, before the uh, Savannah. The police were already in, in, in Rhodesia busy. And then also, of course, the pilots, a lot of them, even the parabats, they were there also. It, 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 it's really not something we can answer to to you in, in, in five minutes, we can't. But for a few words. Was Kwan Kruma coined the freedom of Africa, um, the Uhuru idea. Um, so that sp spread throughout the whole of Africa or the colonized Africa. And of um, course, I don't want to necessarily go into the whole, you know, situation. Um, and so, so it is freedom for Africa, for the inhabitants. That's the one part of that. The other part of the coin is the Russian or the communist doctrine with the bipolar um, situation in the world, the East against the West, whereby the East wanted to colonize or not colonize, but wanted to um, get hold of Africa and eventually to capture South Africa to dominate the um, sea route but, um, around the, the Cape, which would have um, given them a, a very, very strong strategical position in um, world politics. So um, all the countries, the colonized countries became um, peons, uh, peon, um, in, 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 in world strategy. So Afri Africa became the chessboard between the East and the West. So um, whatever the, the Russians or the communists and the Cubans planned in terms of their national strategy um, or international strategy, the West wanted to counter um, and the US and um, the UK predominantly um, the main players on the, on the chessboard. So it was a quasi war fought on the fields of Africa. Now, ideology wise um, wherever you align yourself you will think you are right so that's why you know the big 
talks comes between, you know, was Kasinga one or legitimate or whatever. It's it's all propaganda and politics. So to get to the specific question, Rhodesia, Rhodesia um, was just another um, pawn on the chess table of Africa. And um, the, the, the main threat or the main communism um, got its foothold in, let's call it the, the Great um, Lakes region, um, and, and it shifted south. It shifted south. And you should not separate the communist ideology and the Uhuru um, um, idea of Africa. Those two goes parallel and it works in tandem. And that is, to my opinion, the reason why the dominoes collapsed and the wars were fought. I'm talking about the Portuguese colonies. I'm talking about the British colonies, etc. So liberalism in terms of um, politics also, to my opinion, plays a part. And um, I'm going to make a wild statement, but I think um, when they saw who they had to deal with in South Africa, um, some of the brains in the UK and the US said it will be easier to deal with other type of brains than um, <laughs> uh, to deal with um, another type of brain. So um, they contributed um, to the collapse of um, whatever was instituted in the southern tip of Africa. Um, and I will call it the Namibia or Southwest Africa, Rhodesia and South Africa. So it, um, the, the, the masterminds just turned against us, backed the democratic process, ensured that the, um, by means of the so-called um, democratic process, then they would be able to manipulate and dictate to the new governors um, whatever they wanted to achieve at the end of the day. I think there's a new colonialism taking place in Africa. Um, it's a topic of another day. Uh, I'm a soldier, as, as Doe Do said, and not a politician. Um, but um, that's my opinion at this point in time. Yes, thank you for that to both of you, because when you live overseas like myself, you often ask these questions, why didn't you people just, why did you even start fighting? And I always say to them, you know what, we're not stupid, we looked north, and we saw what was happening north, and we saw also who was involved in the northern countries of South Africa, to the north, and we saw what weapons they were using, and we saw what communist load slogans and things we were seeing and going on. And then, of course, we decided we will have to, to fight until such a time that we can get a negotiated settlement, which is what we did. And it could have been different. If you look at Namibia, perfect example of what could have happened. And the fact that it didn't happen in South Africa, don't blame us. OK, the last questions. It's a fellow called Johnny Marange or Maranch, I, I don't know how to say that. Uh, you ask if you people have any regrets. Do you have any regrets from serving your country? Jack, do you feel bad? No, negative, not at all. I'm very proud of what I did. And I would do everything all over again exactly as I've done it before, if I can. I will just change two things. I will wear ear protection from the first shot I fire. And I will not marry uh, too young. The rest, I will do exactly the same. So I don't have any regret. Well, that's a very healthy outlook on life, I'm quite sure. Franz, same question. Do you have any regrets? Of course, not at all. 
if I can choose my life over, I will do it in the exact same way. Um, I think what I've learned and what is materializing throughout the world is um, people realize that, uh, and, and I know it stands clear in history, that um, the era from the 70s up until 94, South Africa was one of the strongest, most progressive countries in the world with initiative, with development, with maintenance, with everything. So um, what I stand for, what I fought for, I am extremely proud of. And um, yes, have I got the regrets? No, not at all. Thank you. I just want to say to the viewer here, we lost those time uh, of the three hours. Uh, not a problem. I'm sure that they will agree with what, us, what we have to say here. I just want to say something also about South African economy. As an attorney, I, I met many, many people. And some were quite powerful financially. They did well. And I asked this one uncle, I said to him, sir, why did you come to South Africa from the UK in about 1972? And he was from the UK and he went to a place called Brits. He thought it was English. He said when he got into a swimming pool, the, the African children would get out. It's not an English place, but it's a wonderful place nonetheless. And I asked him, I said, you were a trade man, you, you were a tool maker, you could have gone anywhere. Why not Australia? Why not New Zealand? He said, because you had highways. There was something happening in the country. There was something being built. He says there was a buzz. And he saw that and he decided to get off a boat at Durban. And that's exactly why he ended up in Brits. And he later created one of the biggest retail uh, shops in, in, in Africa. I'm not going to mention names. Now, let us get to the very last question. Very briefly, do you have any advice for a young man who is listening here? He has a dream to go to special forces. Can you say to him, "Do it," or rather, run away? Or, or what do you what do you suggest to such a fellow? Uh, if he want to do it, if he's convinced he wants to do it, then he must get fit and hard, like we have spoken. Get his mind right. And if he pass, like I've said, he won't be sorry. He won't regret it. Uh, but if he does pass, he must wear earmuffs, ear protection from the first shot. <laughs> he must not get married too quickly. And uh, he, will, uh, he won't regret what he has done. I haven't. In fact, uh, life is a little bit of an anticlimax after the Rekis. Uh, you don't, you don't get in civilian life. You cannot compare the experiences. Uh, there is no ways in civilian life, no place where you can gain the experience that you will get uh, in special forces. So go for it. Chris, I will say to him, live your dream. If you dream to become this, become it, and. As Jack has said, and as we've reflected in earlier questions, prepare well, but um, live your dream. And um, what you must remember is there's eras in life. The era we lived in is different from the era of today. So. Um, the stories you've heard, what we have spoken about, will probably not materialize within your era. There might be much more exciting things that happen. But um, uh, live your dream, prepare well, and believe in yourself, believe in your God, believe in what you want to do. Be proud. Never fail yourself. You can lie to anybody in the world, but you can never, ever lie to yourself and to God. 
So um, if your moral structure is sound, live your dream and do it. Well, gentlemen, we came to the end of the questions now, as well as the answers. Thank you for that. We really appreciate it. We appreciate your time. Thank you to all of you who are following us, all the bombs, you know, spreading the word, making your comments. Thank you for that. We appreciate you as well. Until we meet again, God bless.